a creator God who's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent can be sovereign and throw souls that that God created into an eternal hellfire. That God would have every right to do that. But that God cannot be good. And let me explain. Any father, the Bible tells us that if we're evil or flesh, as they always believed, like human was evil back in those days. If human fathers know how to give, give good gifts to their kids, how much more would an eternal father in heaven know how to give good gifts? And so you have to help me understand how any father that said, kids, you're bad. And if you don't worship me the right way and give me exactly the right attention and repentance for what you did, I will throw you into an eternal lake of fire. I will set you on fire. You'll have to help me understand how anybody would say that's a good God because it's just not a good God. So how do I see hell? Let's talk about that just a bit. And then on the live uh, broadcast, we'll uh, I'll be willing to take some questions and do some Q&A time. But this is how I see what hell and sin kind of look like. And, and the, the thing is, when we're talking about hell, we have to understand sin. And as I talk about this, then I'm going to tell you why I think it's the worst theology in the world is the theology of hell and does more damage and why it turns us into a cult. So I'll have that coming up. But let me just take you through this idea of, of God and covenants in the Bible. So we see this story in Genesis, uh, boy, I don't have it from, I think it's Genesis 16, where God is talking to this guy, Abram, and, and basically makes a covenant with him. He tells, tells Abram, go get these animals, cut them in half and make this bloody path. And what would happen in those days is two men who are heads of household would cut animals in two, split them in half, and then walk in the bloody path made between them. And this would be a covenant to say, okay, forevermore, our families are joined together. Your enemies are my, my enemies. Your family is my family. I will take care of your family as if they're my own. And if I don't do that, if I fail to do that, or if anybody in my family ever fails to do that, may it happen to me as happened to these animals. May I be cut in two and destroyed just as these animals do. And then what happened is God went through the pathway and Abram did not. And so what that was symbolic of is God saying, okay, all of the penalty for anything heaven does wrong for all of eternity is on me, said this God in the story. And he said, and by the way, all that happens wrong in your lineage, Abraham, for all of eternity, which by the way is the Jewish community, the Christian community, and the Muslim community all came out of Abraham. Sorry, evangelicals. I know it's a tough thing to hear, but God's covenant was through all of history, if your lineage breaks this covenant, that will be on me as well. And so we have this Abrahamic covenant, but then we go, and, and so we're told in the Bible on several different occasions, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham never prayed a sinner's prayer, never knew who Jesus was. David, Joseph, Tamar, all these people, they never became Christian, yet they're called righteous in the Bible. So for somebody to say you have to be a Christian to be righteous ignores the fact that the Bible tells us on several different occasions that it was Abraham's belief in God that made him righteous. And because as we hear in Hebrews, he was looking forward to a city that has foundations who des whose designer and builder is God. So he was following this partnership between God and heaven. And through that partnership, he was made righteous, just like it, the Bible says, Enoch walked with God. And one day he just was in heaven and wasn't on earth anymore. So righteousness in relationship with God looks very different than the theology of you say a magic prayer and then you won't go to this place of eternal conscious torment. So evangelical teaching on that is just flat out wrong. So that is, in my view, the Bible saying, and this is what the covenant 
of the, the agreement is between heaven and humanity walking together. But then we see this picture at Sinai after the Israelites have come out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and they're at Sinai. And we have this God character of the Bible now saying that that covenant that I had with Abram, now I'm going to resettle and recommit to that covenant with a whole nation of people. And, and as this is happening, this, this huge torrent of earthquake and fire is coming out of Mount Sinai. And the people start to say, um, that covenant is pretty scary because that God is pretty scary. And the idea that we're going to have to walk in relationship with that God scares us. So you, Exodus 20, they say, Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said, do not fear for God is testing you that the fear of him may be before you and you may not sin. So the people are like, that's a scary God. Moses, you be our go-between. They they choose a religion rather than a relationship with God. You be a go-between for us. And, and in essence, we want to have a God, <laughs> not of relationship, but a God like our neighbors have that we can pray to and he'll make our crops grow and we can pray to and he'll kill our enemies and we can kind of manipulate God a little bit. So that's the God that we want. Boy, I don't have much activity going on on TikTok. Are you guys able to see me on TikTok? Just checking. And then we, and so then when the people go to go into their promise land, to go into the promise God has given them, they're living out of this new covenant, the Mosaic covenant, which is we'll obey the rules. And if we don't, you'll punish us. And so God says, well, that people can't earn the promise of heaven. And he says this, that but in the book of Numbers, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went and his descendants shall possess it. So again, it wasn't like say a sinner's prayer and join a religious thought, adopt the right set of laws and live by those laws. No, because Caleb was one saying, we can go into the land because God is walking in partnership with us. He was able to go into the land. So God brings this covenant that we now call the Abrahamic covenant. People say, we don't like that covenant because that puts a lot of responsibility on us and we can't manipulate God that way. So give us the rules that we have to live by and we'll choose this other covenant. And then Jesus comes and, and we believe, or at least the biblical story is to bring a new covenant. That's why we have a new Testament. This is a new agreement between heaven and hell. And that is what the Christian belief should be before it got bastardized by Paul and some other things that made it into this, say a sinner's prayer, be a terrible person and go to heaven. And that person out there trying to trust God and it being credited to him as righteousness, that person's going to eternal conscious torment. But I'll get into that more in just a little bit. So Jesus comes and here's uh, he's he's a, a Jewish person. He's living in first century Jerusalem, uh, or at least operating in first century Jerusalem. And and people are saying, "Are you trying to get rid of the law?" And Jesus says, "Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, heaven and earth will pass away." Uh, before heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So many people hear this and they're like, see, Jesus didn't come to do away with that old covenant of the Mosaic law. He came to be a part of it and live under it um, because he said the earth would disappear before the law would be changed. Well, Heaven and earth pass away doesn't mean the end of the world as we know it, as R.E.M. would sing. It meant, you know, we might say, well, hell will freeze over. You know, it, it was an idiom of the day until hell freezes over or till a snowball can exist in a hot place, you know, kind of a thing. That's what he's saying. He's like, hell will has to have to freeze over before anything happens other than all being accomplished of the law. Well, then we see here in John 19, it says when Jesus had received the sour wine, now this is when Jesus is on the cross, he said, it is finished. To Telestai, or there's a, there's a, a, a more singular version, Teloi, he says, he says, it is 
accomplished in essence. Tetelestai is a commercial term of the day that says all is fulfilled. The covenant has been fulfilled. The contract, all of the goods that were to be transferred under the contract has been contract has been delivered. And so now the terms of the contract are fulfilled and you can no longer be held under that contract. So I believe what Jesus was saying in Matthew 5 the law is in place. I'm going to live under the law because that's what's required of me to be the symbolic sacrifice like those animals that were split into uh, between Abram and God. Until all is accomplished, the law is still in place. And so then on, on John 19 says, all is accomplished and therefore it is fulfilled. And so no longer can we say, we're under that old rules and laws because Jesus said it is accomplished. Now, one thing that Christians will tell you is like, yeah, so God wants to work in, in concert with humanity, he wants to get rid of rules, but you have to say this sinner's prayer to become a Christian and avoid going to hellfire, you horrible, terrible person. What they miss is this concept that's that's voiced in Romans chapter 5, and it's actually a part of an entire passage of Romans 3, 4, and 5, that says, if you believe that way, then you believe Adam's act is greater than Jesus' act. You believe the theology of original sin is more powerful than the theology of God taking the penalty for sin up on heaven and saying humanity will not be held uh, responsible to that sin. And so they'll say, no, 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 you have to say the sinner's prayer. And they miss this. It says, for if because of one man's trespass, that's Adam's sin, this, this is the theology of original sin, which I think is another bad theology. But if you believe in original sin, if you mean, if you believe because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in and through the one man, Jesus Christ? Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, and I always ask people, okay, original sin believers, do you believe that Adam's impact, Adam's act impacted all men? And everybody will agree, yes, all men, yes, 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 all men. Then this says, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for some of the men who receive from Jesus. No, it says for all men. And by men, we mean humanity. So to believe that when you're born, you are automatically under the penalty of Adam's sin and there's nothing you can do about it. But Jesus' act requires you to join, to say a sinner's prayer and join a religion of Christianity to become Christian, I believe is heresy because you're saying Adam's act is greater than Jesus' act. That Adam has more to, to say about our lives than Jesus does. It goes on to say, for if by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made whole. That's the new covenant. So the new covenant shows us that there is a requirement of loving your neighbor as yourself and loving God. So that means I have to love myself. Out of that has to flow a love for my neighbor. And oh, by the way, my neighbor is defined as that person who I think is too lowly too much of another race, too much of another religion, too much of another financial class to deserve God's favor. I have to love that person or else how am I any different than the worst sinner in culture? So there is an expectation of if you're walking in relationship with this new covenant and walking in relationship with heaven under this new covenant, there will be an improvement of who you are. And so we see the symbolism of fire throughout the Bible and we think, ooh, see, the Bible does talk about hell. It's talking about fire, but fire in the Bible is more often 
a purification tool, a purifier, than it is a tool of punishment. You see the picture on the screen on YouTube and on the Bible talk. It is the boys in the fiery furnace. The fire released them from their bondage rather than being a punishment for them. We see fire in the story of Isaiah at the throne of heaven, being a purifier for Isaiah saying, I'm not worthy to be here. And, and then the theme throughout the Proverbs and Psalms is of fire being a refiner's fire. And in Hebrews, we finally see what I believe is this idea of our final reckoning of our lives after we pass from this life back into eternity. Hebrews 12 27 through 29 says, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. So we see again, like the Israelites at Sinai saw the mountain quaking and fire and all this stuff. Hebrews 12 takes us back there again and says, you're going to see that earth being shaken again. And you're going to get to make the same decision the Israelites made. And you're going to get to decide, am I going to follow religion? Or am I going to walk in partnership with God? Am I going to have a spirit of Caleb? Or am I going to have a spirit of a people that wants to have a manipulated God that we can manipulate to do what we want by being good under a set of rules? Do you get what I'm saying? And if you go into eternity living under the bondage of the set of rules, Jesus called it a bondage, then you're going to be judged under that. And in Romans, it tells us, law doesn't get rid of sin, it creates it. Like if you have a set of rules that say, oh, say a sinner's prayer and you get to go to heaven and you can't be gay or divorced or married more than once or masturbate or any of the other sins we talk about all the time, then you're building a religion that gives you the ability to get to God and get to heaven with no relationship with that God or with each other. So we see this symbolism in Hebrews 12 of being taken back. Do we choose to live under the set of rules? Don't drink, don't chew, and don't date girls that do, or live under relationship with God that says, you are going to have to work it out with each other and with heaven. And that's a lot harder. Jesus said, that's a much higher standard. You say, don't murder. I say, you don't even get to talk with hatred in your heart towards somebody. You say, don't commit adultery. I say, don't have lust in your heart. Don't treat women as second-class citizens. Don't treat gays as unhuman. Don't pass laws and use transgender athletes as a bargaining chip in your little political game. There's a higher standard when we start to live out of relationship with God and man. And Christians don't want to have to live up to that standard. So they want the rules and they're choosing the rules. So we're at this mountain in Hebrews 12, and God says, yet more, yet once more will I shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is the things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire, or we can say again, a purifying fire, that, that it will burn up the things that are of earth and leave behind what, what are the things of heaven. So if you're wondering why is there so much hell, hellfire sort of symbolism in the New Testament, I believe, this is my belief, you don't have to believe this way, I think that's pointing towards the Jewish belief that you inherit eternal life or you inherit death, not eternal death, but death itself, like you cease to exist as a person, that judgment is going to be, I believe, let's burn off what's of earth and let's leave behind what's of heaven. And, and that that you bring in that's of heaven will take you into eternal life. And there may be as some Jewish belief is that your soul gets back in line and comes back and, and tries it again until you get it right and get to go into eternal life. Or it may be 
that your soul just ceases to exist, which is also a Jewish belief. It is a also a Christian belief called annihilationism, that you won't be in hellfire for all of eternity, because again, that would be a terrible God that would do that to you. That would not be a good father. That would be a horrible being that would do that. But maybe that God does make a deal that says, well, then your soul will just cease to exist. I believe we're going to be judged. We're going to have a purifying experience that could be a little painful. A purifying fire is going to leave a mark, but then what's left is of heaven and we get to be with a loving God who says, perfect love cast out fear. So this is what I ask everybody. Would the God we know represented in the life of Jesus be a being who creates souls knowing full well they will spend eternity burning in a fire that he created and continues to fuel? Does a good God create souls with a proclivity for sin and then throw them into eternal hellfire for acting out on the proclivity that he created in them? How do you convince me, Christian? And I would love to see your comments on it now, that that is a good God. And we see in Matthew 7, it says, Then you who are evil, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? If I have, as a human being, would never set my children on fire, then what would give us the slightest freaking idea that a good God in heaven would do that, would throw his children in fire? That's my question for you. And let me finish with this. I believe the theology of hell is one of the most horrific theologies. And, it's, and it is born out of this original thin, sin theology, which I also believe is incorrect because it makes us into cult members. And what is what is a cult member? And I know my evangelical friends are like, oh, there we go with the cult. And I've resisted that term for a long time as well of calling Western Christianity and evangelicalism in particularly a cult. But what is a cult? A cult is usually a group of people typified by having a charismatic leader that people want to follow. And that could be Trump. That could be some of the mega church pastors that are out there. I don't care what you want to call it. But here's, here's what makes evangelicalism, in my mind, the evangelicalism that I was a part of, a cult. In a cult, you must adhere to beliefs of the community or be put out of the community. You must Agree with everything the community believes or you'll be excommunicated. Second, those beliefs are all life encompassing. It's not just, here's a religious belief, let's gather around that. Like, let's have a knitting group and we all agree that we like to knit. And, and then we go and have other parts of our life. No, it's all encompassing. And in evangelicalism now, it's not only a religious belief system, is it? But there's this strong pool that you also have to vote a certain way and be a part of a particular party and hate those of a different race or religion or denomination or voting preference, right? If you are from that other party, you're a socialist, a Marxist, a BLM follower, as if that's a terrible thing, a CRT subscriber, as if that's a terrible thing. So a cult says, you have to believe like us, and it has to encompass your whole life. A cult also says, and you cannot ever hear a belief that's outside of our belief system. You have to stop your ears up from hearing anybody that would disagree with our belief system. And let me tell you, if you read the comments on my social media pages, you'll know evangelicals cannot hear a differing opinion. And finally, then you must destroy whatever destroy looks like, anybody who voices those uh, alternate beliefs or beliefs that differ with the community belief system. So not only is the theology of hell destructive to children by making them terrified of, of a God who just wants to throw them into hell. And I know my evangelical friends will say, that's not what we teach that he wants to throw him in the hell, but that's 
what children hear. It is a theology that creates a cultish following in the church. And so it's time for the theology of hell to go to hell. Anybody that tells you the Bible is clear on what hell is, is either a liar or they don't know the Bible. The Bible is anything but clear, but I hope today I've given you a sense of the thread of the story of God, of uh, and by that, let me say, heaven's partnership with humanity throughout history and what it can look like to think of hell and sin and relationship with God in a different way.